Would you please bow your heads with me as we begin this morning? Dear God in heaven, we thank you for another wonderful day. We pray, Lord, that you will send your Holy Spirit, send your holy angels, so that we may concentrate and that you would remove any distraction, remove the enemy from this place, so that we may be hearing, be able to hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we begin, there are just three things I want to ask you uh, if you can do for me. Number one, please turn off your cell phones. I know the doctor's in here, so please turn off your cell phones. Number two, can you please pray for me? And number three, think. That's all I want you to do. Think of the message this morning. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that we are living in a time where acceptance is everything. It plays a big part in who you are, and the people around you as well. A time where everybody is looking for an excuse to do what they want to do. A time where everybody wants the green light to act according to their will and their way. Correct me if I'm wrong, if we're living in an anything goes, just let it flow type of society. We want what we want so bad, and we're willing to listen to and do what everyone else wants us to do, not what God wants us to do. Even to step on each other's toes as long as we get to the top. There's a story recorded in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, where God tells Adam and Eve, you see, there's this one tree, one tree that I don't want you to eat from. And what did Adam and Eve do? They ate half the tree, right? They just gave me that. Oh, this fruit is so good. God had specifically told them not to eat from that one tree, that that fruit belonged to God. But in the mind of Adam and Eve, they already had decided that they wanted to venture and see what this was all about. They decided to question his authority. And I don't want you all to get caught up in the hype. Because when you allow yourself to get caught up in the, in the hype, you find yourself in the middle of a spiritual warfare. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. There was a boxer once who, who was, he was getting pummeled. He was getting tore apart. He was in the ground. He was bleeding. He had swollen eyes. His trainer looks at him and says, Fred, you're doing great, buddy. This guy, he's not even touching you. The box is on the, on the ground, he's just trying to catch his breath. And he looks at his trainer and says, you better keep an eye on that referee because someone's killing me. <laughs> Friends, we ought to know who we are in battle with. A few months back, I shared a sermon with you all about do you know your enemy? And we went through the Old Testament and the New Testament and I encourage you all to find out who your enemy is. To study for yourself to understand what the enemy is capable of. But it does not matter how smooth of talking this one boxer had. He was in the battle himself. He was engaged in a physical battle. There is no nice thing I can say that will smooth things out to let you know that you are in a spiritual battle this morning. I want to ask you all a question, and you know I like some answers back, if you will. Who is our enemy? Who is our enemy? Would you please go with me to Revelation chapter 12, and we'll begin at verse 7. Revelation chapter 12, and we'll begin in verse 7. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, and it says, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels, waging war with the dragon, the dragon and his angels waged war. I want to stop really quick and just point something out. You notice that when you come to the side of God, you belong to Him. But once you decide to venture into the other side, you no longer belong to God. All these angels belong to God prior to the war, but now John tells us, the dragon's angels. 
You notice that? Verse 8. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Jump to verse 17 also. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. So now, who is this serpent that, that Revelation is talking about? Who is this serpent? Have we heard of this serpent before? Yeah. Wait, where have we heard about this serpent before? And back in Genesis, right? You see... Uh, we have an enemy that is so skillful, so tactical, that he says, you don't have to worry about the Old Testament. Just read the New Testament. You'll be okay. But how would we know who this serpent is if we don't go back and read what Genesis has to say? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And we'll read just verse 1. So you, we can all see how smart, how cunning that our enemy is. Now, I mentioned earlier of Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, where God specifically tells Adam and Eve that one tree, stay away from it. But now here comes our enemy. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, did God, did God really say you can eat from any tree of the garden? You see that question there? It raises suspicion, right? It pushes Adam or Eve to question God's authority. Now please understand, up to this point, Adam and Eve had no idea what a lie was. Understand that when the angels were in heaven, they had no idea what a lie was. Everything that Lucifer was telling them was truth to them. <coughs> was the devil always this bad? Is, is he the type of person that we portray today with the pitchfork and the nice tail going on and the, the little cape going on? Is, is that how the, the Bible portrays our enemy? No, right? He comes in suits. He has nice suits. He was the most beautiful angel the Bible reports. And would you please go with me to Ezekiel chapter 28 and we'll begin on verse 12. Ezekiel 28 and we'll begin on verse 12. And it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation of the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you, sh you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, and then it names them all. I'm just going to jump down. And the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day you were created, they were prepared. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in all your ways. From the day you were created until, until unrighteousness was found in you. So our enemy before, how one of you mentioned, he was a perfect created being. He covered the glory of God. But he started noticing how every time Jesus walked into a room, it started getting to him. Oh, I, can, I want some of that. He, he began to covet something that could never belong to him. Lucifer was created by God as well as the other angels. He was the covering cherub and began to notice that the worship that was being directed towards God, he started craving some of that. So what caused Lucifer to fall from heaven? He began to covet a position that not, did not belong to him. 
There was also pride. There was also jealousy, discontent, self-exaltation. Lucifer decided to question the authority and law of God. Now I just want to ask a, a broad question. Is there pride today? Is there jealousy today? Is there self-exaltation today? Here's another question. Why is worship so important for us? Keeps the enemy away. If you notice, the enemy tried to get some of that worship in heaven. It didn't work out so well, so he got kicked out of heaven. So now he comes to earth and he says, I need to break up this relationship between this couple and God. So he breaks that relationship. So now he messed everything up there. So now here we are today in the 21st century. In the society we have, where we believe that we can do whatever we want, we are our own person, we are all in, an individual, and that's the mentality that the enemy has infiltrated in our minds. Worship is the key factor on this ongoing warfare that we are involved today. There is a war going on between God and Satan. Were you aware of that war? Were you also aware that in this very room, Right now, there are evil angels whispering in your ear, distracting you. Were you aware of that? You might be thinking, there's no way. The enemy in God's house? No, there's no possible way. Well, you better believe it. But, God says that if we say to Him to leave, in Jesus' name, He will leave. Amen. And I just thank God that in Jesus' name, I want to say right now, I pray that a lot of you would focus and listen to the warfare that we're involved in because it is a serious thing. And if we are not ready for this warfare, we are going to be taken off our feet. A soldier does not just go to Iraq or Afghanistan and say, well, here I am, what do we do next? No, there is proper training. There is conditioning. They, there is a whole platoon that trains together and uh, that's what we are doing today we are engaging in a warfare and a lot of us don't even realize that we are in a war there are some of us who worship something or somebody whether it's power prestige food pleasure possessions we even worship our own opinion but God clearly says thou shalt have no other gods before me. For some of us, our God is that big screen on our living room. But I'll leave you to deal that by yourself. <laughs> Unless we worship God and we put Him first, whatever takes the most of our attention, the whatever takes most of our time, that is our God. The Bible records in the book of Revelation, where we read earlier, that a war broke out. The enemy all around us. Are we all on the same page? The enemy is all around us. He was able to fool one third of all the angels. One third. Can anybody number them for me? You can use my fingers too. That's a lot of angels, if you ask me. So how serious is this war? that we're involved in. How serious is it? I was able to put some stuff down. There was a lot more, but the list would have been going on and on, and I didn't want to have it too long. Satan managed to convince one-third of the angels to question God's authority. He managed to convince Adam and Eve to question God's authority. He managed to cause chaos in this world that led to a flood, which only eight people decided not to believe in that apostasy. You notice that eight people. He managed to bring towns into extinction, Sodom and Gomorrah, and he manages to make the very people of God fall under his lies and his deceptions. So this war that we're in, I believe is quite serious. And if we don't take it serious, trust me, he knows what he's doing. Allow me to read for you. A uh, comment from Ellen White in the book Great Controversy, page 507. 
She says, Satan sum summons all of his forces. Okay? All. Not just one here and then there. No. He summons all of his forces and throws his whole power into combat. Why is it that he meets with no greater resistance? Why are the soldiers of Christ so sleepy and indifferent? It is because they have so little real connection with Christ. Because they are so destitute of His Spirit. Sin is not to them repulsive and abhorrent as it was to their Master. They do not meet it as did Christ with a decisive and determined resistance. They do not realize the exceeding evil and malignity of sin. They are blinded both to the character and the power of the Prince of Darkness. There is little enmity against Satan and his works because there is so great ignorance concerning his power and malice and the vast extent of his warfare against Christ and his church. So in other words, we're blinded. Spiritually, we're blinded. Sin, it's okay. As long as you don't hurt me, we're okay. Don't bring that into here. You do that out there. We don't look at sin for what it is. And this goes back to the message we started earlier. What is your enemy and do you know what your enemy is capable of? Our enemy today, well, he's more capable of destroying us if we allow him to. But Jesus says, come unto me. Because when we are with Jesus, who can stand in our way? No one, right? So now, I understand eating a small fruit, that's not that big of a deal, right? It's not like they went and ran someone over and I mean, murdered him, right? It's just a little fruit. It's not that big of a deal, right? I see some heads shaking. No, 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 that was not a good fruit. So let's go to 1 John chapter 3. And we'll just read verse 4. 1 John 3, verse 4. First John 3, verse 4 says, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is what? Eating the fruit was a sin because it was a direct rejection of God's law and only a few requirements he had. It was an open rebellion against God's law and authority. By rejecting the one commandment that God had given them, they rejected immortality. They rejected living with Jesus in the garden forever. And one thing that I want to point out is that Jesus gave him that choice. Because you see, that's how much he loves us. He gives us that choice. Yeah. It doesn't force you to love him because then we'll be robots. And what good is that? You'll run out of batteries eventually and then what? But God gives you that choice. Do you want to be with me or not? Satan's success rate is astoundingly high, and it seems almost unbelievable. Now, we had a Bible study last night, and we began to notice how in our culture today, we are going from bad to worse to just plain out terrible. Now, if you disagree with me, it's okay. Just look at what's on television today. Look at what our children are watching today. Look at what our children are wearing today. What our children are listening to today. Tell me that the enemy is not working hard. We read 1 Peter 5.8. The enemy is like a roaring lion, just waiting who he can devour. When the lion is approaching the little gazelle or a zebra, it makes not a single noise until it's about to pounce on its victim. You have no idea where the enemy is right now until it's too late. That's why the Bible calls us to be aware and know the power of the enemy. Don't think that he's some guy with a pitchfork. No. He is the most beautiful created angel known in Scripture. The only thing that the enemy lost when he was kicked out of heaven was the opportunity for him to go back to heaven. <coughs> The last time we read that was in Job. 
that he was able to go back to heaven. But besides that, his beauty is still perfect as can be. So is there hope for us? Can we fight against this enemy by ourselves? I, I don't think I can do it by myself. I'll be honest with you. And I don't know if many of us, not here, but many Christians can do it by themselves. I believe that we need Christ to fight this enemy. Amen. And if we don't know our, our Bible, because this is our sword, right? If we don't know our Bible, He will sweep us off our feet. Because Jesus told the enemy to leave every time with, it is written. Amen? Amen. Not with, oh, I heard Clinton quote this scripture the other day, and it says, no. You need to know what's in here and put it in here so it naturally comes out when you are confronted with a temptation or a, or a tough decision. But I believe that there is hope for all of us to withstand the deceitfulness of the enemy. And then you will go with me to Romans chapter 14. Romans 14. Romans 14, and we'll read verse 11. And it says, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. And that includes Amen. even the enemy. There will come a time, there will come a day, where even the enemy will be forced to bow down on his knee, and then we will all be able to see that he was wrong and God was right. That's when we will see that the, this great controversy that we are dealing with, the warfare between God and Satan, will be done and over with. No more crying, no more death, no more back pains, or no more knee pains. Amen. All gone. Because Amen. Jesus says, there will come a day when everyone will proclaim me as God. Amen. Jump back to Nahum, chapter 1, verse 9. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 9. Nahum chapter 1 verse 9. And it says, Whatever you devise against the Lord, He will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up twice. So once God gets rid of the sin problem, He defeats the enemy for good, that's the end. You will not have to go back to that same lifestyle you lived before. Now, today, every time we make a mistake, and we, we comment about this last night, every time we make a mistake, every time we believe we've sinned, we come to the feet of Jesus, and we ask for forgiveness, and then Jesus says, okay, I forgive you. But Luis, I don't want you to go back to the same place where you were before. He gets all of our sins, crumbles it up, and he throws it in the bottom of the ocean, and he puts a big old sign, no fishing. But there I go with my little paddle boat. Ah, I want that. And then we get my scuba gear and there I go searching for those sins. You see how tricky the enemy is? God has forgiven us for whatever sins we've done in the past. We start afresh, new. Slate is clean. But there we go, searching back. Going right back where we were. God says that He will purge from the universe the destruction of sin. Sinners, the devil, and his angels. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. No longer will you have to worry about, is the enemy after me? No, it's gone. God will get rid of it once and for all. Sin will never arise to mark God's universe. We have a Savior who made it possible to have an opportunity to spend eternity with Him again. Amen. We are involved in a spiritual warfare today. If you were unaware of that, Sister White's comments were true. Perhaps we are spiritually blinded and have no idea that we are in a war. Time is short. I'm sure you've heard that many, many times. Time is short. And by the way our society is looking today, we are killing each other. We are kidnapping people and this world is just going downhill. 
That's why the Bible clearly says over and over again, choose today whom you will serve. Not tomorrow, not New Year's Day. And I'd just like to leave you with this quote. Great Controversy, page 512. While Satan is constantly seeking to blind their hearts, us, let Christians never forget that they wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the wicked spirits in high places. Never forget that, friends. This war is a serious war, and we're fighting in a very important battle. And we are at the dead center of it. Never forget that we're not just fighting an ordinary enemy. We are fighting the prince of darkness. We need to arm ourselves with the armor of God. That's the only way we can withstand his battles. But we have hope that Jesus is coming back very soon to take us home. And this hope burns within our hearts. Amen? Amen. And hope that will set us free from all sin, from all the chains that are bounding us, a hope for a better tomorrow, a hope that motivates us to emulate Jesus. If that is your desire this morning, I'd like to invite you to stand with me as we sing hymn 214. Amen.